All right. All right, let's start in another few seconds here. All right, we are live and rolling. So the next talk is Hacking the Samurai Spirit by Isaac Mathis. Isaac flew in here all the way from Japan just to give this talk, so everybody give him a big hand. And for our, our listening pleasure, he's going to be delivering this talk in English. Okay, can everybody hear me? Uh, cool, good evening. Uh, my name is Isaac Mathis. The title of my presentation is called Hacking the Samurai's... La Okay, I'll hold the mic. Uh, the title of my presentation is called Hacking the Samurai Spirit. I figured if I named it something you know, as cool as this, they wouldn't deny my presentation, and it worked. Um, I had about an hour's worth of material, but unfortunately I had to cut about half of it. Uh, so I'd still like to cover as much material as possible, so please bear with me as I'm going to go really fast and just blow you away with information for the next 20 minutes. As a disclaimer, I don't claim that you know, anything I present is 100% accurate, or anywhere near that, and there's probably disputable things. Um, I'm going to have to make many generalizations. You know, all X people are like this, all Y people are like that. Please be aware that generalizations only have so much truth to them, and you know, it's easy to play devil's advocate. You know, but what about this? Um, yes, I probably know, already know. I'm only making these broad generalizations to get a point across. Uh, so please bear with me and take everything with a grain of salt, and please hold your questions to the end so that I can get through this in time. So first off, who am I? Uh, I'm a nobody. I don't do anything special. I've been earnestly studying uh, computer security in Japanese for about 13 years, uh, since I was about 11 or so. During the day, I work for the Hyogo Institute of Information Education Foundation, which is part of Carnegie Mellon, Scilab, Japan. At night, I lead the security solutions for a Japanese company in Kobe, doing mostly web application security now. Um, I don't consider myself good at either, but I know a little bit of both. Uh, hopefully, I can share some of my little knowledge with you today. So what is this presentation about? Today I would like to talk about something that most people do not talk about or even consciously analyze maybe, the ninth layer of the OSI model. So here we have the OSI model. Um, at layer seven we have applications, and who uses applications? People, right? And what's a big influence on human behavior? Culture. Uh, so in other words, you know, most Americans act and think, American, you know, because everyone around you is American. Most Japanese act Japanese because, you know, everyone around them is Japanese. Uh, you probably get the idea. So why should you care about other people around the globe? Uh, first, because the internet is a worldwide phenomenon, not countrywide. Um, usually not only one person has all the right answers to everything, so knowing what is out there and how other people are trying to solve the same problems could be essential to finding the best solution. Uh, three, people act completely different according to their culture and environment. So you can't hack layer eight before you can hack layer nine. Uh, now if you're an American working in America and will never a interact with the outside world, you know, you already understand layer nine, so you don't have to worry about anything. However, this world is getting more and more global and united, and probably most of you will work with information security on a global layer, uh, scale, if not already. And if you have any experience abroad, you'll know that the culture barrier is usually the hardest firewall to break through. Um, and finally, it's fun to talk about, or at least I think so, so I hope you'll find this interesting. So, let's get this started. Uh, so I don't mean to offend anybody, but I don't believe Japanese make good hackers in the true sense of the word hacker. The whole society is taught from birth to think inside the box. You know, this buffer only holds 20 bytes. Why would I ever think of putting anything more in there kind of mentality. Um, taught by proverbs like the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. So while Americans naturally all strive to be individuals and different just for the sake of being different, the Japanese do the exact opposite, which kind of goes against the natural hacker instinct, right? Also, most Japanese are very ethical um, and will do everything in their power to follow the rules no matter how silly or pointless they might be. So for these and probably many other reasons, uh, most Japanese aren't even interested in being hackers. So in the traditional sense of the word hacker, uh, Japanese may not be the best, but in a more broad sense of hacking, there are some things that Japanese naturally do great. That is not inventing, but innovating. 
So Japan has just spent the past 2,000 years taking everything from China, you know, the writing systems, religion, philosophy, art, etc., making it Japanese, and usually innovating it to the next level. So today they're doing the same thing, but on a global scale. So cars, uh, robots, electronic cell phones, etc., did not originate in Japan, but they make some of the best in the world today, right? They even innovated the smiley face to the next level. <laughs> so you know how in the U.S. we have these four or five different smiley faces, the happy face, the sad face, the sticking out the tongue face, which I can never tell is you know, a good thing or a bad thing. Um, well, in Japan, we have about 30 or 40 different uh, smiley faces, you know, covering virtually any emotion possible. And the best part is, you know, you don't have to turn your head 90 degrees to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Japanese are also all about the efficiency. It's even built into their language. So if there's a word with more than four syllables that's used frequently, saying it will be considered cumbersome, and an abbreviation will usually be created, such as digital camera is digikame, Word processor, wapro, presentation, present, and copy and paste, copy pe. Um, so if there's a contest to see who can push the most data through a certain link or who can write the smallest shell code for a given task, you know, the Japanese would probably dominate in this area. Uh, finally, Japanese are extremely hard workers. They actually work too hard. And a lot of the time, you know, if you bang your head against something long enough, uh, it'll eventually break, right? So there are people finding zero day in Japan. They just keep very quiet about it. Um, they don't post a full disclosure. So even other Japanese don't really know what their neighbor is up to. So although some people might have the image that Japanese are far advanced when it comes to the internet, it still doesn't apply much to the common users. Um, so most Japanese still don't use com start using computers until college. And since everyone has internet connectivity on their cell phone and can do whatever they want, you know, send email, uh, check the news, um, download music, whatever, many people do not even see a need to use a computer. As the internet and security industry originate from the U.S., it's natural that these things take a while to reach Japan. Um, but things are getting better as information flows faster. Uh, so the Japanese do not have the same security mindset that most Westerners possess. There isn't even a word that translates right for security, so they use the English word, security. The only words that translate somewhat are anzen or anshin, meaning safe or relieved, which is kind of different, right? Um, but this too is changing, and more people are catching on. Privacy is a big issue in Japan, and many people care much about it, whether they realize it or not. The Personal Information Privacy Law was enacted in 2005 as a reaction to a couple very large companies screwing up and leaking personal information on a couple million of their customers. Uh, this enactment has highly affected Japanese companies as now if they leak any personal information, you know, an email address, a phone number, whatever, they get hit very hard with fines and not to mention they lose their reputation as this all gets uh, highly publicized by the media. And in Japan, reputation means a lot. So leaking personal information is by far the biggest fear of Japanese companies. However, if you're on the selling side of security, um, it makes a great point for selling security. So laws in Japan are getting stricter as security incidents rise and people get upset. However, things have just started and there's still many loopholes and confusion out there. Such as, stealing intangible objects is not a crime in Japan. And guess what information is? Intangible, right? Uh, so if you steal data from your company using one of their USB thumb drives, you can get in trouble because the USB thumb drive is tangible. But if you use your own USB thumb drive, then you're pretty much free to take whatever you want. There are still no laws against creating viruses, which I'll talk about later. Um, until about six months ago, it was legal to record new movies at the cinemas. Of course, publishing the movies on the net was still considered copyright infringement, but all you'd have to do was say you're recording the movie for personal use, and everything would be fine. Finally, there's no fair use in Japan, which results in some interesting things, but unfortunately, I don't have time to elaborate. So hacking the samurai way. The Japanese had IDSs way back in the day, but since they didn't have computers, they used people. So around the Edo period, maybe 1500s, 1600s, the Satsuma clan of Kyushu created an artificial dialect with unique intonations for their people so that if a spy came in from the outside, they'd be found out easily. 
Um, so basically what happened was the leader of the Satsuma clan said to his people, you know, okay, everybody, from today we will start talking a little different. And then everybody starts talking with these weird intonations. So then if, you know, someone comes in from the outside, you know, hey, wasabi guys, um, you know, they know he's a spy and he gets killed and all that fun stuff. No tick hacking. Knocking over ATMs with a crane isn't very subtle, but surely effective. Um, this pad faked around 2002 with 57 incidents and only two arrests. Um, uh, things increased. Um, the police seem to have caught on the next year and arrested 33 people, but still, you know, 44 incidents, 32 failed attempts. Um, as you would expect, different social engineering techniques are required for different cultures. Um, what, work, what works in one country may not work in another, and vice versa. So in Japan, we have the one-click contract. It's a phishing attack usually used on porno or dating sites. Uh, there are various techniques, but I'll just discuss the basic idea. What happens is, once you enter the site, uh, you get a message saying, by clicking the previous link, you have agreed to the contract. Please deposit X amount of money into such and such bank account by tomorrow, or the fee will be doubled, and then all this legal jargon to try to confuse them. Then one trick is to look up their city by IP address and tell them that you know where they live and that you'll go after them or file a lawsuit against them if they don't pay. Uh, so people you know, think, oh no, how do, I, how do they know where I live? And what's an IP address? And they get scared and they pay. Um, and the requested money usually isn't ridiculous, it's about $100 or so, so most people can afford it. And by the way, this is mostly legal for some reason, uh, so a lot of people are making a lot of money from this and not getting caught, or not getting in trouble. Um, so this technique works great, works in Japan because it exploits uh, Japanese characteristics of Japanese behavior. Uh, most Japanese hate causing trouble or being dragged into trouble, so they'd rather just pay the money instead of, you know, have to worry about some scary guy knocking at their door or something like that. No tech session hijacking. In 1968, 300 million yen was stolen from an armored truck. 300 million yen is about three million dollars, but in 1968, so in today's money, maybe a little bit more. Um, this incident was creatively dubbed the 300 million yen incident. Uh, what happened was that somebody found out that a truck transporting 300 million yen from point A to point B was going to be crossing this road here. So that person dressed up like a police officer on a white police officer motorcycle and chased down and pulled over the truck. He told everyone inside that he just received word that there might be a bomb in the truck and to let him check. Uh, so as he's checking inside, he sets off a road flare, and as smoke starts filling the truck, he yells, you know, it's going to blow everyone out. So everyone runs for their lives, and he drives off with the truck. Um, what's funny is, apparently the escaped people thought that this police officer was trying to save their lives by driving the about-to-explode truck away, and thought, wow, there goes a courageous man as he drives off with their money. Um, eventually, they figured out that the truck never blew up, and that this courageous police officer was probably not coming back. Um, so the real police went on a manhunt for the next... Uh, several years investigating an unprecedented 170,000 possible suspects. However, he was never caught. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so in the early 2000s, social engineering became very popular. Although there are many techniques today, this all started out with the so-called it's me, it's me fraud. What happened was a young sounding person would call up these senior citizens and pretend to be their child or grandchild. Uh, when asked who they were, he'd reply, or they, or they, it's me, it's me. And then, which, which in Japan is natural because the Japanese language is very vague. Uh, so the senior citizen would guess who it could be, you know, is this Hiroshi? And then you reply, uh, yeah, it's me, Hiroshi. Hey, I just got into a car accident and I need to pay a couple grand on an out-of-court settlement or else I'm going to be arrested. Or, you know, hey, I took out money from a loan shark and he's after me, you know, I need to pay him quick. Uh, so the naive senior citizen gets tricked into depositing money um, for, his, for their grandchild trying to help them out. Um, so right now you're probably thinking how much damage is being done with this kind of social engineering. Um, in 2003, there was a sharp rise with almost 4,000 incidents, causing around $40 million in damages. Uh, this continued the next year, causing around $207 million in damages. In 2006, 100 people in organized crime, the Yakuza, were arrested after causing around $90 million in damages. 
And luckily, these incidents have been widely publicized by the media, and uh, laws have been um, much stricter, um, so there are less attacks. However, there are still people devising sophisticated targeted attacks. Uh, so to su sum things up, social engineering attacks in Japan usually exploit certain characteristics of Japanese culture, such as wanting to avoid trouble, um, vagueness of language, strong trust, um, compassion for family members, etc. This doesn't work so uh, much so well in the U.S. because there's so much di di diversity, uh, so it's much harder to predict, you know, a uh, person's cultural background and how they'll react to a certain attack. So it's interesting to analyze how different cultures react when they get the power of anonymity. Let's see what the Japanese have been doing with it. Uh, can I get a show of hands of who has heard about Winnie? Okay, maybe like 10% people, maybe 10 people or so. Um, it's a Japanese-oriented peer-to-peer file sharing program. Um, it's by far the biggest problem in information security in Japan. Winnie is unique in that it provides confidentiality through encryption and anonymity. And most important, it's written in Japanese so people can read it. Um, so yes, the Japanese people are like everyone else in the world. They don't have tens of thousands of dollars lying around to spend on legal music and software and videos and whatnot. Um, so once people were assured that they could download these things for free and not get into any trouble, you know, a lot of people jumped for joy. Winnie also provides malware, as many people um, put viruses in their shared folder because they're curious to see what will happen. Um, the best one known is called Antinny, uh, short for anti-Winnie, which is a very unique virus in that although being the lamest virus ever created, um, it's caused an enormous amount of damage. Um, so this virus does not add you to a botnet or rootkit you or even delete anything. All it does is copy your personal, uh, personal files to your shared folder for the world to see. Um, so this has been the cause of a huge amount of personal information leakage, ranging from regular people to companies small and large um, to even the police. About a year ago, there wasn't one month that would go by on television where um, you know, they talk about how some company or agency leaked uh, personal information through Winnie. There was even one person who committed suicide after his personal information was leaked on, uh, out to the world. So this is a very serious problem in Japan. Although everyone knows that Winnie is bad, old and broken, uh, there are still about 360,000 users. Um, and everyone is curious to see uh, about the future of this Winnie network. So-called dark sites are gradually increasing in popularity. This is an anonymous cyber underground used by the Japanese mafia, the Yakuza, and others to buy and sell um, illegal goods and services. Uh, literally, almost anything bad imaginable is happening on, uh, in this underground. Th and the unique thing about it is that it's usually only accessible via Japanese cell phones. Uh, this is done for secrecy purposes, so if you search on Google for these sites, you won't find them, or even if you do find them, uh, you won't be let in unless you're coming from an IP address from a Japanese cell phone. The Yakuza like it because now they can recruit more people than ever and anonymously. The side admins, the middlemen like it because they don't have to do any dirty work and they get paid very well. And the end users like it uh, because now they can find jobs and it adds a layer of anonymity between them and their partners in crime. Um, the police obviously do not like it because now it's uh, much harder to track down these people. Um, of course, they're monitoring these sites, uh, but everything is written in code. You know, I'm looking for somebody who can fly over rainbows uh, type of thing. Uh, so it's very difficult or impossible to prosecute. So, recent security news. On January 24th, not even a month ago, the first person ever uh, in Japan was arrested for creating a virus. The virus spread through the Winnie network disguised as a popular anime. When somebody opened the file, a picture like this would pop up. Uh, this cute girl says, oh my, oh my, you're still using Winnie, I see. If you don't stop in 0.5 seconds, I'm going to brutally murder you. <laughs> and then after 0.5 seconds, uh, you notice that all of your media files have been deleted. Um, <laughs> However, as I said before, there are still no laws against creating viruses in Japan, so they busted him on copyright infringement charges. <laughs> yes, if only this person got explicit permission to use this picture, he'd have no problems. So finally, some future threats. 
contactless IC cards, or smart cards, as you American folk know them, um, are being put into everything possible in Japan. Um, all the new driver's licenses, credit cards, train passes, you know, whatever. Uh, there are still no public vulnerabilities yet. However, rumor has it that the encryption was intentionally made weak for fast authentication. Uh, this is because Japanese people are always in a hurry and they don't want to place their IC card over the sensor for more than, you know, 100 milliseconds before the gates open and let them into the train station. Um, Sony's Felica, by far the biggest player of IC cards, uh, is also rumored to have vulnerabilities, but everything is being kept hush-hush for now. So, for the country with the most widely deployed uh, cell phone infrastructure in the world, I'm slightly surprised that there is still no malware for cell phones in Japan. Um, this could be partly because Japanese cell phones don't run Symbian, like 80% of the world. They originally all ran Tron. Um, today, most are running Linux or window Windows Mobile. Um, my theory of why there's still no malware is that the mobile virus writers uh, don't read Japanese, and the people who read Japanese don't write malware. Uh, sorry, can you hold on for the end? Who, who could do what? The, the Yakuza could probably, could probably police the cell phones better than anyone else. They don't want viruses. They don't want that network to go down. That's how they make their money and be safe. In other words, spread the virus and die. Yeah, just like the Russian... The just like the, the Russian mob could probably take down large chunks of the internet, but they make entirely too much money off of it being up to, to screw with it or to let other people screw with it. it. The criminals are making money on the internet. They want it up. They will keep it up better than the cops. Yeah. As long as they make money on it. Um, okay. I'm, I'm still not quite sure exactly what you're we're getting at. Um, It. Okay, um, I don't think... Or cell phones as well. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. I, di I didn't think about that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the, some, some things have still not reached Japan yet. I don't think, uh, you know, the Yakuza are, are you know, have, have really the skill and really fully understand what's, what's going on yeah, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Um, uh, sorry, let me, let me finish this right quick. Um, so cell phones, they're, it's potentially a very lucrative area for bad guys, um, especially as many of the, of the new phones can act as credit cards. Uh, so things will probably change in the future. And then finally, uh, some lessons learned. You know, I said culture is layer nine, but if you think about it, it's really layer zero. You know, if the Japanese created the OSI model, layers one through seven would most likely have been completely different. Um, it's always good to know what works for certain cultures and what does not, especially since security is not one solution fits all. Um, people have to be aware and knowledgeable about certain issues in order to work on a global scale. Uh, so I could probably write a book about, you know, how many times the Japanese try to do business in America or Americans try to do business in Japan, but failed miserably um, solely due to the culture differences. Um, finally, the cheesy, you know, we can all learn a lot from each other. Um, this line said a lot, but unless you really go out, go out of your way to start learning from others, you probably won't realize what this means. Um, usually what one culture is poor at, another culture is great at, and what that culture is great at, the other culture is poor at. Um, so my personal advice, if possible, go abroad, you know, see what other cultures are doing better, and mimic that. Um, so I'm sorry if I went over time. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just one last thing, if anyone's interested in working, studying, research, you know, traveling to Japan and want some advice, or if you're in the area and you just want to talk, uh, contact me at kobe.ninja at gmail.com. Uh, give me feedback as well, whatever. So, so yes. your last point was that we could learn, uh, so I wonder if you could just sort of give us a quick nutshell. What, what security lesson could we learn and apply from, uh, from Japanese culture? From the Japanese culture? Ah. <laughs> mm. Is 
there, there, there are pen testers. The question is, you know, if, if the market exists in Japan, um, it does exist. Um, just, it's probably comparable to the, the U.S. market maybe five, eight, ten years ago is, is where they are today, probably. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't answer your question. Let, let me think about it. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. Come, come talk to me after the conference or after this. Um, that's a, that's a great question. Another question. Uh, yes. Uh, for the dark sites, you said that they were restricted by IP for cell phone IP by the Yakuza. Yeah. How are they able to discriminate between cell phone IPs and regular IPs within Japan? I, I'm sorry. How are they able to tell which are cell phone IPs and which ones are regular IPs? Yes. How are they able to do that? Like, is it just um, a block? I, I think I think there's a, a list of the registered, um, you know, cell phone I, IP addresses for um, Japanese cell phones. Is it, I'm I'm not you know completely sure, but that's that's what I hear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll talk to you over here. How far away was that?